Hello and welcome. Um, my name is Manesh Santani. I'm editor for Regulation Asia. Um, I'd like to first thank uh, Jimmy Tong at the SFC for an interesting discussion. Uh, quite a great way to kick off uh, day three of our event and certainly uh, serves as a great launch pad for our, for our next panel. Um, we're now going to discuss financial crime and abuse in capital markets. I'd like to welcome uh, three of our speakers from stock exchanges in Asia Pacific. Um, first off, we have John Witz, Head of Listing Enforcement at uh, HKEX. Uh, John has 20 years experience uh, relating to financial services, uh, disputes, investigations, uh, and regulatory enforcement matters. Uh, now, now I know John joined uh, HKEX in 2019 to establish and support uh, the Listing Review Committee uh, before taking up his current role in enforcement last year. Welcome, John. Thanks, Manesh. Good to be here. Thanks very much. Uh, next, we have Jennifer Teo, who has led the security surveillance team at SGX for the last 10 years. Uh, her team conducts real-time monitoring for unusual trading activities uh, to detect uh, potential market misconduct uh, and other uh, SGX trading rule breaches. Uh, Ms. Teo also oversees SGX's uh, investigation functions for the securities markets. Uh, welcome, Jennifer. Thank you, Manesh. I'm happy to be here today. And, and we're happy to have you. Uh, and finally, we have Mohammed Azar Hamidi, Executive Vice President and Head of Sur Market Surveillance at Bursa Malaysia. Uh, Azhar leads the market surveillance function for both equities and derivatives. He also has broad experience investigating market offenses uh, and is in fact credited with helping uh, Bursa Malaysia to enhance its, its investigation processes uh, reduce turnaround time and improve automation over the years. Uh, welcome, Azar. Thank you, Manish. Uh, thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, it's a privilege, and uh, thank you for having me. Uh, you're welcome. So, 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 of course, um, I, I, I'd like to to kick off uh, by maybe uh, building on some of the themes that uh, that Jimmy Tong uh, at the SFC discussed earlier. Um, I'd like to maybe start off uh, by asking Jennifer and Azar, um, sort of just sticking with that social media uh, scams and manipulation theme. Uh, are, the, are these concerns for you in, in your markets as well? Uh, let's start with Jennifer. Sure. Thanks, Manesh. We continually monitor such activities and will not hesitate to curb them when they become a concern. So sometime last year, we actually received alerts on unusual trading activities in a few securities from our surveillance system. So as part of our process, we checked the uh, investment discussion forums and we found posts promoting a particular chat group on Telegram. So Telegram is a popular mobile chat application. We then monitored the group closely and managed to match the chats to actual trading activity. We managed to ascertain the identity of a couple of the vocal members of the chat who first appeared to accumulate shares in particular securities, then through the chat, incite other members to participate in pumping activities in these securities before they dumped their own shares at a profit. For this case, we worked very closely with the relevant authorities to stop the activities and also issued a media release in December 2020 to warn the public of possible pump and dump activities exploiting Telegram chats and other social media channels. More recently, in February this year, following the GameStop saga in the US, SJX Redco also jointly issued a statement with our regulator, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, to advise the investing public to be on heightened alert to the risks related to trading in securities, incited by discussion forums and social media chat groups. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Az Azar, what are you seeing in Malaysia? Uh, Azhar, can you hear me? Uh, Azhar, I'm not sure you can hear me. Um, I, I was sort of asking uh, whether you're sort of seeing a similar theme in, in Malaysia. Sorry, I cannot. Can you hear me? Yes, so we can hear you.
Go, go okay, ahead, uh, Basically, uh, social media is a preferred uh, attraction tool by retail investors. And social media scam and manipulation are more prevalent uh, with the increase of retail uh, participation in our market. Essentially, the perpetrators may attempt to exploit the social media and engage in spreading false or misleading or promotional information about the company in order to create hype, thus induce public investors to purchase the company shares. The exploitation of social media for market manipulation, such as pump and dump scheme, or some say it's a ram and dump, uh, have more profound effect as the information can, can spread and reach large number of investors within a short span of time with minimum effort and at a very relatively low cost. Based on Jimmy Tong case sharing, I also like to share an overview of our case on pump and dump via social media. Based on our observation, the pump and dump scheme can be divided into three categories. First category, an individual who self-proclaim as stock market guru to give investment advice via his blog, Facebook account, YouTube channel, where he himself sometimes hosting a live streaming to his followers. This individual normally will acquire a large amount of particular shares prior to giving by recommendation to his followers and backed by his own fundamental and technical analysis. Another second category, a group of individuals, even community, who actively run researching groups via WhatsApp, via Telegram, and even a foreign group in Facebook and also chat room in established stock market website. They are actively recruiting new members through this platform. They also take position before make bar recommendation to their members. The third category, which I consider as a large scale operation involving a syndicate group, they begin the operation by acquiring a controlling stake up with the company and then promote the company by a series of disclosures and creating a lot of hype around the company to pump up the share price. During the process, they will also trade in the shares of the company to create volume and push up the price in order to create an impression that something big is really happening in that company. But once the share price of the company shoot up to a level they desire, they will dump the shares to make huge profit. These are the some examples of pump and dump uh, scheme that we have observed that we, where we have detected, which resulted in further investigation and also in transformation. Another key uh, concern in our market uh, management is relating to possible false or misleading promotional disclosure made by the listed company. For example, last year, during the height of COVID-19 pandemic, some companies have taken advantage of retail investors' interest in the market by making all sorts of announcements in an attempt to promote their company's prospect and boost their share price. Last year, there was a surge in company announcement of new investment of business collaboration by way of a OU, letter of intent, and distribution uh, agreement. Uh, for example, like you know, uh, relating to uh, manufacture of glove, uh, face masks, ventilators, and also distribution of test kit for COVID nineteen and even vaccine. So these are the key uh, concern in our market. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Azar. Uh, now, John, I'd like to bring you into the conversation. Uh, Azar mentioned a, a, a few themes around uh, manipulation, um, sort of uh, uh, one around uh, uh, you know the syndicate groups. Uh, but also, um, you know, sort of involving uh, a listed company's disclosures, uh, which I know is kind of a key area of focus for you. Uh, can you sort of describe uh, how HKEX initiatives sort of intersect uh, with the SFC's concerns about manipulation? Sure, yes. Um, and so, certainly, uh, it's something that we're keeping a very close eye on. Uh, the manipulation side is really one that's primarily for our colleagues over at the SFC, but we will work very closely with them to provide them the support that they need. But where we and HKX are gonna take a much closer look is if there's any suggestion for any sort of complicity from within the issuer or within the individuals who work within the issuer. Um, so if there's any suggestion that that's happened, then that's something that we'll need to get involved in or wanna get look very, very closely at. And often that will manifest itself if it's gonna happen as you suggest, through the form of disclosures. Either there's a disclosure which is misleading or there's something that hasn't been disclosed that should be disclosed. Um, and so if there's any real issue around that, then that very much is a subject of um, HKX's enforcement actions. And this goes way beyond market manipulation and ramp and dump and, and all that, that uh, all those issues. If you look at the sanctions that, that we at HKX publish, um, 
you'll see quite a lot of disciplinary cases are brought just around people failing to comply with the disclosure obligations. We've got very broad disclosure obligations under the listing rules. That's part and parcel of making sure that the market is informed and fair. And so we take it very seriously if we think that there's a problem there. Oh, I'm just building on that. I, I know that HKEX has recently released um, a new enforcement policy. Uh, I, I'd like um, I'd like you to maybe talk a bit about that. Uh, if you can tell our audience uh, what sort of motivated the publishing of that new policy, um, perhaps a little bit about your enf enforcement uh, priorities. Uh, and I suppose, um, you know, how has the new policy been received by the market so far? Sure, yeah, happy to talk about that. Um, I mean, we have been uh, reflecting really over the last couple of years about um, all of what we do within enforcement. Uh, the thing that's been most visible to the public in, in that regard has been uh, a public consultation in relation to the listing rules that relate to disciplinary powers and sanctions, which are very much um, the, the, the key rules that uh, underpin all that we do in, in enforcement at HKEX. But at the same time, we've also just been reflecting on all the other uh, pieces of the puzzle um, and including on the areas that we should be concentrating and our, and our approach um, and our priorities. Um, and part of that was just going back to the, the sort of fundamental question of why enforce, why take enforcement action at all? And I think there's really sort of two important things to keep in mind when thinking about that. The first is that HKAX forms part only part, I would say an important part, but only part of a wider regulatory framework within Hong Kong. There are other regulators, particularly the SFC, there are other law enforcement agencies, there's the police, that there are there are plenty of people who are around and involved to make sure that things are done properly and fairly. Um, so when you you have to remember first of all that's just it's part of the overall picture. The second thing then that, that follows from that is that our enforcement actions are actually best focused on those who are on the ground at listed issuers or who are working with listed issuers um, and who are in a position to be able to prevent things from going wrong in the first place. The point is that no regulator is gonna be able to stop fraud, financial crime, any wrongdoing by simply punishing people after the event. That's too late, the money's already gone, the problem's already happened. Um, so what, a lot of our focus is on is making sure that the people who are in a position of responsibility at the issuer have got in place the right framework to minimize the chance of that happening. That leads on to uh, the thinking that really led into the formulation of our three uh, enforcement priorities, uh, which are responsibility, uh, controls and culture, uh, and, and thirdly, cooperation. Uh, I could talk about those for far longer than you'd probably want me to in this session, but I'd like to just say, if I can, a little bit more about the first two, which are responsibility and controls and country. Uh, hopefully that will help to illustrate what I mean by them. Firstly, in terms of responsibility, what we're talking about here is making sure that people who are working for or at listed issuers in Hong Kong understand the role that they have to play. Um, the can't, focus can't just be on the business and making money there is an important regulatory role that they need to play. And that's particularly true for directors, but it's not just limited to them. I mean, there will be uh, others who surround them, as I say, there'll be senior management members, there'll be advisors, um, and they will also have a role to play. Uh, one of the things that we need to make sure is that these people understand that they've made a substantial commitment by going onto the board or by working at a listed issuer and much is expected of them to try and make sure that everything is run as tightly and safely as possible. And so they need to know that if they're passive or if they assume that someone else is gonna take care of these things, then they're at risk of falling uh, below the standards that are expected and, in, and into enforcement action. The second of our uh, uh, priorities is around controls and culture. And that is of critical importance. An issuer has got to have the right framework for compliance. A lot of that means just making sure that you've got the right internal and risk management controls in place. You've got to make sure that the proper oversight is there, proper checks and balances exist. Um, but we also thought it was important to emphasize that having the right culture is, is um, a, an element that's perhaps sometimes forgotten as well. It's not just a case of having good policies in place and having 
good um, people reporting to the right people in, in, the, in the right way. That is essential. But if the culture is wrong, then that can also mean that things go wrong. So taking that as a whole, uh, I think the important thing to take away is that um, arguably our most important cases that we bring in HKX for enforcement purposes, our disciplinary cases, they're less about focusing on people who've done something that's really, truly wrong, but maybe the police or the SFC need to get more involved in. It's more about focusing on the people who their heart may well be in the right place, but they need to make sure that they've discharged their responsibilities to keep the issuer and the environment that it works in as safe as possible to stop anything more serious happening further down the line. That should be no surprise. It's the same thing that we all see in the AML space. We're not saying that the banks are taking money, but we're saying the banks are there in the financial markets and they've got to make sure that controls are in place to stop others doing things wrong. It's a very similar sort of idea at listed issuers. And I'd encourage anyone who wants to know more about um, what we're thinking in that regard to look at our new policy statement, which is up on the HKX website, to read uh, our enforcement bulletin, which is a six monthly newsletter. Um, and we've just issued a, one uh, in the last few weeks. And I'd encourage everyone to read that if they want to know more. Uh, thanks so much, John. And, yeah, and you've actually touched on a lot of themes that we've been covering over these three days, uh, you know, about responsibility, about controls, about culture. Uh, we have a panel later on in the day about culture as well. Um, uh, so, so, yeah, these are all really interesting uh, comments, and it's interesting to hear about your priorities um, in, in that vein. Um, I, I'd like to also ask um, Jennifer and Azar about, about your priorities. I, I know your focus is a little bit different uh, on sort of the market surveillance side. Um, but I'd like to ask sort of um, maybe starting with Jennifer, what, what have you seen change in the last, um, say, 12, 18 months? Uh, how have you adapted your surveillance approach and, and how have you reprioritized? Well, over the past 12 to 18 months, the trading landscape has shifted quite a bit as we see more participation from the retail market. Many of these retail participants appear new to trading and they were possibly attracted by the market volatility and also the proliferation of chats on investment and trading. These participants will benefit with education on trading and investments as they could be just jumping on the bandwagon and trading on herd mentality. Hence, we have been more proactive in reaching out to this group of investors. For example, the media release on our observations in social medias were meant to alert these group to do their own due diligence and not to invest blindly on a stranger's advice. So for SJX Redco, enforcement is also a key priority. In June, we announced that we are expanding our range of enforcement powers and requiring issuers to have a whistleblowing policy. These changes pave the way towards um, swifter enforcement outcomes and also enhances the protection of investors. It provides more certainty and clarity to the market. And for us, we also enjoy a close relationship with our statutory regulators. This can be seen through the swift action taken to curb the errant trading activities stemming from the Telegram chats, as well as the joint statements to the public to warn them to be alert. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Azar. I, I suppose, um, you know, from previous conversations, uh, you might be seeing something similar in terms of the trading landscape. Go ahead. Taking cue from Jennifer, I think uh, the same approach also has been applied by Lucia. So what, what we have observed uh, you know, uh, for the past uh, 18 months, yeah, uh, the influx of retail investors into stock markets since COVID-19. This proliferation of retail investors was uh, also a fundamental across the globe, right from US, Europe, also Asia. Uh, in Malaysia, retail investors' participation before the pandemic was around. 30%. Then uh, during the pandemic, retail participation has increased to above 40%. Where Busan, Malaysia has recorded new high trade volume in, Delhi in August last year. And high retail participation has continued until today. With the increasing retail interest in the market, uh, our market has now become more volatile with more stocks experienced pricing due to the speculative trading and also a short term view by investors who are also influenced by business and economy and also political outlook and also development of economic IT. Uh, we also have observed the rapid uh, intangible uh, key play uh, in the market between healthcare, logistic technology and also renewable energy. More major news or event uh, can cause big moves up and down in the market. Taking into consideration of the big change of trading landscape, uh, which is more volatile. 
we have enhanced our surveillance detection through several initiatives. First, we develop and implement new bespoke alerts or report on new manipulative pattern and techniques. For example, uh, the variation of order book integration and also intermarket surveillance between cash and deputy market. Second, we reviewed and changed our surveillance parameter using machine learning and also new sandbox in the surveillance system to carry out that testing of alert parameters every six months. All as and when required to ensure the alert parameters suit uh, the current market condition. This also helped us to maintain optimum level of meaningful alert in, in our system. Uh, our signal system is connected to PUSA distinct information network that provide fit for complete disclosure to look at timely price selection. We are currently looking uh, at web online program to enhance our monitoring and detection of false or misleading information news in the cyberspace. Apart from time detection of irregular or manipulative terrain pattern, our priority is also to ensure timely disclosure of material information to facilitate trading and investment decision by the public investors. Generally, there are two main categories of information that market surveillance can compel the listed company to make further disclosure. One is where we see significant increase in price and also volume. Should we observe any sudden increase in price or volume of them, but not supported by any material or news in the market, a query will be issued to the company to ensure that necessary disclosure under the company. Second, when we see a media coverage of the company, if there is a material information in the media which had not been disclosed by the listed company, then we will issue queries to the company so that adequate and clear information is given to the market for public investors. So these are the changes in prioritization of surveillance approach that we have adopted for the past two months. Uh, thank you, Azar. Um, uh, you, I, I heard you mention a, a little bit about um, machine learning. Uh, so maybe I can turn this to, to Jennifer because I understand that SGX uh, has introduced uh, AI into its surveillance approach. I think that was in 2019. Uh, can you tell us a bit about this and how this is improving your regulatory processes and, and outcomes? Sure. So we introduced the AI in December 2019 and the timing of this was very opportune because when the global pandemic hit in early 2020, the AI enhancements were already in place and allowed us to reap its benefits amid the increased market volatility and trading volumes. So how it works is that the AI recognizes that there's a correlation in the price movement of SGX listed securities to the reference market indices. So by leveraging on this correlation, the AI will remove price alerts for all securities, which move in line with the reference market. This helps us to remove excessive noise and allows us to focus our attention on other alerts. And this AI will be activated only on days of increased volatility. And in March 2020, it actually helped us reduce the alert noise by about 25% and allowed us to concentrate on other alerts which required our attention. So following this initial implementation, we recognize that there are opportunities for further enhancements. Um, these include utilizing the futures market prices to track when the reference equity markets are closed and also tiered activation to handle different levels of volatility. Other than in the area of surveillance, SGX RECCO has also introduced the use of AI and other REC tech solutions to enhance its oversight of issuers. And the solutions automate the extraction of data from reports such as financial statements to compute certain indicators of financial risk to alert of any possible financial distress or irregularities in the listed company. Um, this early detection would then allow regulatory resources to be directed more appropriately at the higher risk areas and enables us to be more targeted in our regulatory responses. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, actually, we have a question from the audience that I think is a little bit related to this discussion around surveillance. Um, and it's basically asking what are exchanges and, and regulators doing uh, to encourage or require adoption of automated trade surveillance systems uh, by market participants, um, you know, given that manipulation can take place uh, at very fast speeds. Uh, do you have an answer for that, Jennifer or Azar, seeing as you're in this space? Um, well, for us, we 
Uh, we recognize that our member firms have different considerations and also um, on Sorry, how to carry out the... Sorry, I the question again, so I can't actually is breaking. I can't hear clearly. Uh, sorry, just the question was about uh, whether you encourage or require uh, the adoption of automated trade surveillance uh, by trading members. Uh, so, so, yeah, Jennifer, sorry, go ahead. So our members, they are of different sizes, so they will have different considerations on how to carry out their monitoring practices. So generally, we adopt a reasonable basis approach rather than a prescriptive approach. So we still want to maintain the, some standards for effective monitoring. So to help them, um, we provide them guidance through tools like trade surveillance handbooks and member dashboards. Mm -hmm. The trade surveillance handbook, for example, pro um, will provide examples of potential trading malpractices such as spoofing, layering, and marking the close, as well as case studies on prearranged trading. And the member dashboards, which were introduced in 2016, are customized monthly reports showing alerts which are triggered at, at exchange level for each individual firm. This is highly personalized and is part of our proactive approach where we work closely with members to support their existing monitoring tools. So other things to help we also to, to help our members, we also collaborated with our regulator to launch the Trade Surveillance Practice Guide in August 2019. Um, this helps them because from their perspective, it might be difficult to understand where the regulator is coming from. So through the handbook and guide, we want to bridge this knowledge gap by sharing greater insights on what may constitute errant behavior. And also, because um, we feel that these handbooks and practice guides will also benefit the market, other market participants and to help them to understand that such activities are considered unlawful behavior. And so they can be also found on the SGX website. So in all, I think um, well, while some members may not have automated trade surveillance system, well, they have other um, tools that will also help them to conduct their trade surveillance. Okay, excellent. Um, now, um, I, I guess I, you know, in, in, in this discussion, uh, you know, one one of the themes that I find common is that um, sort of some of some of the, some of the measures I, I know that um, Bursa Malaysia, SGX, uh, and Hong Kong Exchange take uh, are sort of a, in a way aimed at improving governance culture uh, in the capital markets. And John touched on this uh, earlier. Uh, I would like to explore this a, a little bit further. John, can you talk uh, a little bit about how? Uh, you're you're trying to drive a better governance and, and culture in capital markets. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if, if you look at our enforcement objectives, which are in the policy statement that I mentioned earlier, there, there are four of the objectives, and two of them are completely on point. One of them is to influence compliance culture, and one of them is to enhance corporate governance. So it, it absolutely is um, the bread and butter of what we do. Um, and, and everything that we try to do, uh, the way that we do that is through our enforcement work. And that includes the sanctions that we publish. And that also includes the guidance materials that we put out on our website. That includes uh, the bulletin that I mentioned earlier. Um, we're always trying to help people understand what is expected of them um, and to lift the bar. Uh, so they are absolutely, absolutely at the heart of what we do. Um, I mean, dwelling on culture for a second, culture is one of these things, it's, it's become, it's been around for obviously, the word's been around for a long time, but I think increasingly over the last few years, it's become quite a buzzword and quite a lot of people are talking about culture. And a lot of people sort of say, well, what does that mean? And then sometimes that gets met with other buzzwords, like, oh, it's all about tone from the top and so on. I'm not trying to say any of that's wrong. I think it, it all makes perfect sense, but actually in some ways, um, my focus on it is a bit more it's something that you can't really write down. You can't really have a checklist for it. It's more about a feel. Um, and when we start investigating uh, something that looks like it's gone wrong, we normally get that feel pretty quickly um, as to what's on the other end. When we're sending out our request for information, when we're communicating with issuers, we're communicating with directors, we normally get a feel pretty quickly of what the culture is like. Um, there are some mistakes will happen and there are some who will accept that they've happened, they'll show that they've learned from it, they'll show that they want to move on uh, and you can see that they've stepped up if they've ever made mistakes in the past, that they're, they're on the right path, they're trying to do the right thing. There are others on the other hand, of course, who are evasive, defensive, 
um, refuse to admit that anything, even despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary, has gone wrong. Uh, don't accept that there's any room for improvement. Think that they've done everything that they're supposed to do. That then, if something has gone wrong, can be a bit of a red flag, can be a bit of an alarm bell and will, will require closer scrutiny. Um, that's just when things have gone wrong, of course. I mean, the other thing that we look for typically in almost every investigation we bring, we'll be asking people about their controls, we'll be asking people about the oversight that they've applied. And we'll be asking about what they've done to basically ensure um, that they remain uh, compliant with the rules. Uh, are people being properly briefed? Um, and that goes all the way down to the most junior staff. I mean, everyone's got a role to play. Are people staying on top of rule development? Are people staying on top of you know, making sure they're receiving the training that they need? Um, is all the information flowing the way it's supposed to flow? Um, are people empowered to speak up? Uh, if you've got someone spotting something go wrong, did they have a chance to say something? And almost every, again, almost every case that we look at, if something has gone wrong, we look at it and think, wow, someone must have seen that earlier. Someone must have spotted it. Why is it taking it this long for someone to say something or for us to find out about mm -hmm. it? And that, again, is a suggestion that possibly the culture isn't, the right, isn't in the right place. Um, and that can say start right from, the, from the, the most junior level where someone just goes, you know, hang on, I'm being asked to do this, but that doesn't really fit with what we normally do or with our policies. Maybe I should say something. Have they got the ability to turn to someone who will be a receptive ear and say, yeah, you're right, thank you for raising that, whether, where, whether or not it goes anywhere, because that's the sort of thing that can stop something really serious going on. So, yeah, very much our enforcement actions are focusing on trying to get people to, to lift that bar. Uh, so so, so you, you raised uh, enforcement actions. Um, uh, that was something I wanted to ask you about, because we've noticed a lot more uh, enforcement activity from uh, HKEX this year. Uh, can you sort of give us a give us an idea why this why this is the case? Yeah, sure. I mean, it, we certainly have been busier this this year than uh, in the past. I think our, our, the volume of cases that we've got um, has gone up. Um, so we're we've got a lot of things to to follow up on. Um, the reason for it uh, is, I think, there's probably several reasons. Um, one is, uh, I think, in part. Um, things slowed down a little bit during COVID um, in terms of, uh, if you look at these, say the sanctions that we've been publishing, there weren't so many in the second half of last year, but this year there's been um, a, a record number. I mean, we've, we've been publishing sanctions um, almost every week, it seems. Um, that in part, I think, is just down to a bit of timetabling. I wouldn't necessarily read too much more into that. And likewise, I wouldn't read too much more into the idea of, um, you know, COVID or um, uh, economic, economically difficult times are often associated with an increase in misconduct or fraud or things coming to light, even if they've already been below the radar. I, I, that may well also be true, but I wouldn't read too much into that for the purposes of what we're doing. I think actually a lot of it comes from uh, increased events. I think um, within the exchange here in Hong Kong, we've got not just the enforcement department who are looking at issuers and directors, but we've also got a a substantial a listed issuer regulation department and they've been doing a great job at um, looking at everything that comes out from the issuers looking at the disclosures and um, following up with their inquiries and i think they've been picking up a bit more uh, they've they've found more um, and they've been able to then send more to us i think that partially that's uh, um, through increased use of technology um so i mean again i think the message there is we're more likely to find things if things are going well, we're more likely to find them and find them early and then that's more likely therefore to be sent through to us in enforcement for follow-up when appropriate um one of the other reasons why the number of cases that you'll have seen published um the disciplinary cases that we've published uh, have gone up this year is because we've changed our uh, or i should say we've re renewed our focus on cooperation or people who don't cooperate i mentioned that was one of our uh, the third the, the, the third priority the one i didn't really talk about earlier um over the course of last year we changed our disciplinary procedures to allow non-cooperation cases so cases where someone we're asking questions and people are just not providing the cooperation that they're required to provide under the rules we changed our processes for dealing with those cases to make it faster and easier to call these people out um and so uh there's 
a, a, a substantial number, I mean, a noteworthy number of cases that have been published this year. If you look at the sanctions, you'll see that people who are not cooperating are being called out and they're typically receiving from the very highest levels of the sanctions available to us for the simple reason that if you're not willing to talk to the regulator, then what place should you have in a regulated market? So um, the, part of the number, if you just look at a few number terms, is to do with that. But that also, I say, ties in very closely with our priorities. And we want to make sure that people realize they can't just ignore it. They can't let it go away. Because if they do, then their name's going to be put out there for everyone to see that they, they don't talk to the regulators. They don't provide the, 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 um, the information that they're required to provide. They don't follow the rules. Um, that's useful, I think, for our market. It's also useful for people overseas who want to see that too. I think that's a useful message for, for our listeners as well, um, sort of the need for cooperation uh, if there is anything that is uh, suspect or goes wrong. Um, uh, and again, I suppose it's, it also speaks to this, to this whole idea of, of culture. Uh, Azar, um, I, I'd like to, I know we spoke before uh, in previous conversations about some of your engagement uh, with, with, uh, with firms in the market. Can you speak about some of the work you're doing to improve uh, the culture of firms that are operating in, in Malaysia's capital markets? Sure. Uh, over the last three years, apart from our routine audit and also enforcement check, we also have carried out uh, various initiatives to communicate, cooperate, collaborate with the stock blocking companies, aiming at improving the compliance culture with self-regulation. Uh, the first initiative is engagement with brokers. We engage uh, uh, continuously engaging our brokers' key personnel, including the aid of dealing, aid of compliance, aid of operation, and also their dealers. Our key focus areas of the engagement includes market misconduct, corporate governance and compliance culture, and also cybersecurity. So the second initiative that we have uh, undertaken uh, to uh, promote the self-regulation is issuance of guided notes. In relation to surveillance, we have issued two guided notes to brokers, one is supervision on trading and the second one is the solution on monitoring of electronic trading. These two documents provide practical guidance for the brokers on supervision and trading and recommended best practices which are supplemented by various illustrations aimed to facilitate effective supervision monitoring of the trades and also market conduct. This initiative is important because it's enhanced towards self-regulation by the brokers. The third initiative is basically upskilling our frontliners. The brokers are our front line of defense. And we have spent a lot of effort in leveling up their abilities and capabilities to manage and also to, to supervise the market. Our market surveillance, uh, BUSA, we have organized various training and forums for brokers management and personnel who directly or indirectly involve the front office monitoring and trade surveillance. This program was conducted to provide better understanding of front office monitoring and situation and how to detect and deter trading abuses. With this initiative, we have observed a change in culture towards self-regulation, where brokers have been self-reporting breaches and taking proactive action to rectify the breaches and put in place internal control measures to prevent recurrence. The brokers also have provided uh, us tip off and even a suspicious trading information on possible market manipulation. Uh, our brokers have also implemented front office monitoring function, where 85 of them have implemented automated front office monitoring, which covered about 96% of our trading value in the market. They also have no material industry-wide breaches by the brokers since 2017. So these are the example of business conduct, culture improvement that we have seen on uh, part of our brokers, which could have been attributable to our initiative. Yeah. Uh, th thanks very much, Azar. Um, I I'd like to also ask Jennifer so something along the same lines. Uh, because it, I guess in previous uh, conversations uh, we've had with S SGX, uh, we've noticed sort of a, a focus on uh, sort of a, a, com a community approach, a, a collaborative approach when it comes to engagement with your members. Uh, can you talk a bit about this, Jennifer? Sure. I think I covered some of these earlier in terms of the yeah. trade surveillance handbook, the, the dashboards, as well as the, the trade surveillance practice guide. So, yes, we do have regular engagement sessions with um, our members as well. Um, this could be to, um, between the exchange and the members, or it would also include um, the regulators at times. 
and such session at during such sessions um topics such as um any trending misconduct that they could look out for we could show them case studies and also when if we do detect any um, potential trading behavior that could become a problem we will also have ad hoc meetings to update them or to watch out for such behavior um, on a day-to-day -day basis we also engage our members regularly to discuss um, specific trading behavior by their clients so definitely since we we regard our members as our gatekeepers we we do engage them really really cl very closely uh, thanks a lot. And, it, and it's really, um, I just want to say, it's really interesting to, to kind of hear the, uh, the, the way that, that, the, that all three of, of these markets, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Malaysia, are sort of approaching uh, these issues in slightly different ways, but, but essentially overall looking to elevate standards in the markets. Uh, um, John, speaking of, of, um, of elevating standards, I suppose, uh, I know that HKEX has recently uh, expanded its Disciplinary, disciplinary powers um, to hold uh, accountable individuals uh, that are responsible for misconduct um, or breaches of, of listing rules. Uh, do you want to share with us a little bit about this? Yes, sure. We, we um, as I mentioned, I think earlier on in the session, we've um, been through uh, a process over the last year or so of consulting the public with a view to updating the listing rules around disciplinary powers and sanctions um, and that's now been concluded and the new rules came into uh, effect uh, earlier this month which we're delighted about uh, so thank you to everyone who participated in that consultation and for allowing us to get where we got to today um, the, the new rules uh, particularly allow us to help focus on individuals um, there's limited value I'm not saying it's a waste of time, but there's a limited value on focusing just on corporates, as I think we all know in the enforcement space. Um, every corporate has to, uh, can only do something wrong because of individuals who are behind it. Now, primarily that's going to be the directors and uh, historically the focus of the exchange and its enforcement action has been primarily on the issuers and their directors. But there are other people who are involved and that very much ties in with our um, uh, focus on making sure people understand their responsibility. So the new listing rules um, allow us uh, much more, um, with much more clarity to deal with not just directors, but also others who have a responsibility and have a role to play uh, and who have failed. So that might include senior managers, uh, that might include advisors. Um, and uh, it, it very, very much depends on the circumstances. As I say, our directors are going to remain very much in, in the front row, um, but where we've seen misconduct effectively being orchestrated by others who are not directors, then we've now got the right toolbox to deal with that. So that's um, a, a real benefit of it. The other major change has been to it, it broaden the range of sanctions that we have available. Um, we ha our sanctions are primarily uh, reputational, uh, so it's, it's a name and shame approach for the most part, um, but we now have a, a broader range from which to choose in order to deliver those sanctions which we hope is going to provide extra clarity to the market on how we see things on um, differing levels of severity of misconduct and having an appropriate regulatory response for those um, so we're, we're we're happy to have got to where we've got to now and uh, and, and i'm sure it was a it was quite a process to to get to this point as well um, we, we have about five minutes left. Um, I, I'd like to give you all a chance to, to give a, a, you know, your, your key messages to the listeners. Uh, but first, uh, Azar, if you don't mind, I'd like to just quickly pick up on something you, you said earlier. Um, you were mentioning sort of a, a, a concern about a cyber risk. Um, can, you, can you sort of share a little bit about how that, um, how, how, why that's a concern and, and in what respect? Uh, social media proliferation of mobile devices and online app space brokers have changed the landscape of marketplace. At the same time, the algo HFT program trading has also increased over the years. So in this regard, uh, we must also aware that these changes come with new risks. Uh, in this case, is the threat of cyber attacks or cyber crime. Last year, I think we all know that you know, there was uh, news on DDoS attack. 
that has taken down one of the stock exchange website for six days, where the exchange could not post a market announcement. And trading at the exchange also was also stopped for four days. Similarly, there is also a mounting risk of hackers uh, taking over brokers and also investors' account. So this is what we call the, the, the new phenomenon with regards to this uh, cyber crime uh, uh, you know, uh, surrounding the capital market. So in short, capital market is not only exposed to uh, market abuse or crime, but it's also facing a risk of cyber attack and cyber crime. So for regulators like us, we need to continue up the game on technology and innovation toward enhancing our detection and preventive measures. And at the same time, we also need to continue enhance and improve our cybersecurity for industry. So that's my take. Yeah. Thanks, Manish. Right. That, no, thank you very much, uh, because I moderated a, a session on cyber uh, cyber crime on Wednesday. So, so it's a very interesting topic to me. Um, so, so just a few minutes left. I, I wonder if we can just um, finish off with with allowing each of you to uh, get to deliver some of your key messages uh, that you'd like our listeners uh, to, to hear. Uh, can we start with you, Jennifer? Uh, final messages? Sure. Well, um, no market in the world has completely er eradicated market abuse and crime, and we recognize that all market participants have a role to play to reduce it. So while we cannot totally prevent, what we can do and have been doing is to educate and deter, educate participants as to what kind of trading behavior is frowned upon, educate our members how to detect errant behavior so they can disrupt such activities early, um, enforcement actions and other tools act as prevention and deterrence in the form of swift actions and effective enforcement outcomes. And all participants, not just the regulators and members, have a role to play in upholding a fair, orderly and transparent marketplace. Thank you, Jennifer. So yeah, uh, education, um, you know, making sure uh, uh, firms know how to detect and disrupt. Uh, thank you. Um, John, would you like to go next? I'll be at risk of repeating exactly what Jennifer just said. Um, I think the most important thing for everyone to keep in mind, because it might require a change in mindset, is there may be plenty of people who are tuned into this. You know, it's fraud and financial crime, they think, but that is something that is quite interesting that bad people do and it happens over there and, and that's that. Um, the message to the people so in my case, for the people who are working at or around listed issuers in Hong Kong is you have a role to play to stop that bad stuff happening, right? You may not be a bad person yourself, but you've got to remember that you've got duties and responsibilities to make sure that you create a safe possible environment so that no bad things can happen. And I think uh, it's too easy, unfortunately, uh, for very well-minded people to just think, this is something that only happens elsewhere. This won't happen in my company, or this is something that someone else will deal with it. And I just want everyone, everyone who's in that position, to just stop and say, "Well, actually, you, how can you be so sure?" Often, when things go wrong, they take people by surprise. They didn't see it coming, um, and then we start looking. We see that actually, not enough was done. So the message is: think about that now. Do whatever you need to do now. Then the bad things don't happen, and then we don't have to come calling as well. Okay, excellent, John. So the, the sense of responsibility. Um, Azar, you get the last word. What are your key messages for our listeners today? Uh, yeah. Uh, so capital market uh, uh, maintain uh, an orderly versus protection is not just a responsibility of regulators, but is uh, responsible for all uh, stakeholders in the market, be it uh, the brokers, the dealers, the listed issuers, the directors, but also even the shareholders. So everyone have a role to play uh, protecting the capital market from uh, market abuses. Yeah, I think that, that's my uh, parting notes. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Um, and with that, we are out of time. I'd like to thank our panelists, uh, John Witz at Hong Kong Exchange, Jennifer Teo at SGX Redco, and uh, Azar at uh, Bursa Malaysia. Um, thank you very much for joining us today, uh, and I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Um, next up, we have a panel discussing AML risks in capital markets, uh, which I think is uh, an area that perhaps doesn't get enough focus. 
I uh, hope you three can can stay on and listen into that. Thanks very much.